So yesterday on the discussion forum on um, online, I posted a um, link to the talk. Uh, you can find it at coetwalding.com. If you go to coetwalding.com, you'll find a publications page. It's the first one. Um, I should, I should, I'm going to preface this um, by talking about three styles of presentation. Because at, at IBM, there were three styles of presentation slides. So I started off at IBM in consulting in 1993. And I, what happened at IBM was that uh, when we started consulting at IBM, there was a lot of, uh, the, the person that started it, uh, Robert Howe, said, we have some smart people, they have no skills. So one of the things that they did is they gave us methodology training for three weeks. And the, one of the things is when they do deliverables, they do them in presentation slides. Now, the presentation slides are created and they can be dense. And the reason they're dense is that you have a consulting team working for six months on a project and then you have the principal come in one hour before the presentation and present as if the next whole six months. And so that means when someone reads the slides, they have to be able to look like within an hour and go, okay, I know what this presentation is about. I have to give this presentation. So the clue is on this style of presentation, if you have a choice between listening to me and reading the slides, you can actually <coughs> listen to me instead. The slides are there, you can follow along, you can take notes if you want, but the idea is to have the conversation so that we can do that. The other, immediately after that, I went to IBM Palisades, and we were uh, in, now instructed, this is an educational facility, where we had images only, no text. And you go on a slide, and you stay on for five minutes because they're discussing imagery. Then the third way I ended up was in IBM Sales, where when you actually give a customer deliverable, the customer can actually take that deliverable and go to a competitor and say, oh, IBM said this. Could you match this or can you beat this? And so in that sense, they actually put content on the slide, but then there wouldn't be enough content to actually do anything with it. So the presentation you're going to see um, is, is long, and it's purposefully long. We are not going to cover all of it. We are going, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this uh, because this is current research, and at a certain point, we're going to stop. We're just going to stop dead because you're going to be tired. And I don't remember when that's going to happen. <laughs> so uh, you are not going to learn everything you need to know about system thinking from this one lecture. One of the reasons we have system thinking in Ontario is we've been actually in this, I've been lecturing this program for a really long time. And what happens is that it takes a while for you to actually learn these concepts. What I'm going to do is I'm going to immerse you in the language and the ideas. And what happens is that actually there was one there's one idea which I think in a couple of weeks we'll be getting to, which I was saying it'll take you ten years to get this idea. Hmm. I'm going to introduce you to the idea, and you kind of go, I don't understand that at all. And then one day you go, Ah, oh, now I know what it means, because it takes a while for these ideas to work. So um, the uh, when I was in graduate school, I had two friends, um, uh, and both of them were chemical engineers. One studied at Rice University, uh, Pierre studied at Rice, and the other one was Craig, who studied at Stanford. And so <coughs> Pierre, uh, they did the, wrote both of them were all doing an MBA, but at one point they're discussing coming on chemical engineering. It was a really interesting conversation. Because what happened was that Pierre started the conversation, and he's now talking about you know, pressures and turning valves and this sort of stuff. And, and the conversation would go on and on. And then I noticed this color of conversation where Craig would start talking about chemical engineering, but it was really theoretical. Now, they have the same degree. The difference was at Rice University, they're a very practical university. At Stanford, what they lecture on, the professor lectures on the content that they are working on that day. That's, they're both undergraduate degrees in the different styles. I'll tell you, today's lecture is like the Stanford style. I'm going to take you in, and if you have uh, get questions, stop me any time. But the ideas are current. And so in the uh, posting, I've uh, clarified this. There, there will be audio recordings uh, of the lecture for people who like the pause button. Uh, there's also links to uh, 2013 lectures there where the article's already been published. And so if you actually want to read stuff and go, oh, I want a solid base, I want to know stuff, then you can do it that way. Uh, but one lecture uh, in 2013 was when I was ISSF president. 
and that became uh, a lecture I actually gave at OCAD, but again, we run out of time, and when I gave it an unlimited time at, uh, at uh, Alta University, it was 85 minutes. So, with that expectation, um, we are going to talk about this question, are system changes different from <coughs> systems, system and change? Because we have an idea, systems change, as supposed to be this new idea. I have a blog post talking about synergy and parts and walls. And so people want to talk about systems, and they talk about their skulls. I, I, the way I encountered this was actually, I started running down this idea of the sum, the, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. You've heard that before. The whole is more than the sum of the parts, right? And so I go to Wikipedia and do that search, and it, and it turns out it's embedded in this, uh, in this post on Gestalt psychology. Uh, we're going back to 1935. And so what happens is that um, this is the reason you're not supposed to be citing Wikipedia in your graduate work, is I'm reading it, and it's like, wow, this is wrong. <laughs> this is not a good understanding. And so when you, I started digging in, and actually, anyone ever been on a discussion page on Wikipedia? Every Wikipedia page has a discussion page where you discuss what the errors are and the correction that happened. And so I posted this blog post, and then I posted the Wikipedia page that said, uh, people don't have a good understanding of what that phrase actually means. And when you go back to the German, because it's in German, and it goes back to translation, the, the correct definition, the correct way of expressing it is that the whole is different from the sum of the parts. It's not more of. And so when people think about ideas like scale, it's kind of like, oh, you know, the scale is like, now someone that's three feet tall and gets to be six feet tall, it's kind of like, well, it might be a different person. But that's not a continuous sort of thing. And a good demonstration of that is water. There's a property of wetness in water. Wetness is not a property of hydrogen. It's not a property of oxygen. So here is an example of a property that emerges from the interaction of oxygen and hydrogen. Um, I was, when I was searching around, I found this BBC article, if water contains hydrogen, which is flammable, why doesn't it burn? Okay, so now we're into deeply thinking about systems, because water is a different type from hydrogen and oxygen. And also there's another article, which was, uh, why does combining hydrogen and oxygen typically produce water rather than hydrogen peroxide? Hydrogen peroxide's got, you know, similar properties, it's got hydrogen oxygen in it, but it's different. So the question that we've been working on, and I've been working with the team on this, is how can we learn about thinking about systems change, system changes, in plural, as different from systems <coughs> and change? And so I, I see some puzzle when people think of this because they're like, well, I don't know what a system is, and now I'm going to wonder what change is all about. And now we're talking systems changes, and it's like, well, let's try to immerse you in that. So this is a lecture I was talking about in, 20, uh, in 2012 that I gave at Alta University. Um, if you want to go back and listen to that, then this is the more standard presentation. The way that I used to lecture up to last year, uh, last year I gave a, a new lecture uh, when I came to this class. But before that, what I would do is I would build everyone up on Russell Acoff. Uh, Russell Acoff is the most cited author in systems thinking. He's written 26 books, I think. Um, and uh, there's a joke, David Hawk, who's uh, Russ Acoff's first student, said that, well, in effect, he wrote one book and then said it 26 times. Um, so it, it was just pretty much true. Um, but uh, uh, what happens is, is that people really like Russ Acoff because Acoff is really clear. And so I do, do recommend it. And the textbook for this course used to be uh, Jamshid Gahar Dagi, who worked with Russ Aikoff for a long time. Now, what I, what I normally would do if we had a lot of time is I would take you through the Russell Aikoff material, and then we understand that. And it's like, okay, I will now spend the second half of the class teaching you what Russell Aikoff is wrong. Because, firstly, you need that clarity, and then you need to get into the other side. But what happens is when people drop out of the class and think Russell Aikoff is the world, it's kind of like, well, no, there's a whole system thinking community outside of that. So um, one of the lectures I gave at OCAD um, 
around that time was called Design Flaws and uh, Service System Thinking. We're focused on breakdowns because the question was what do design students really need to know about system thinking? And so this is kind of the easy way of doing it with seven different ways in which system thinking in effect add to your, your knowledge of design. And in uh, 2018, um, 2016, no, 2018, uh, I taught a course at uh, University of Toronto, the master's course, and all of all my content that I do is available online, Creative Commons licensing, so you can always follow up, you can always find lectures, and you'll find that there's lots to read. Um, in this course, I, the, uh, this was an eight-week course with the uh, information students, uh, information, uh, faculty of information students, and uh, in that case, what the, we did the... Um, the flipped style, and so the students actually taught the course. They would teach the material, and then I would come and, and follow up with all the corrections and clarifications, all that sort of stuff. So the, the, that material, a lot, of the, a lot of it that's still available is, uh, is a student material. So the System Changes Relearning Circle uh, formed uh, a little over a year ago, and this is an ongoing research project. Um, the small team plus uh, one of your colleagues, Zad Khan, is in the SFI program. And he's been with, with sticking with us. Uh, we've been um, there's four of us who've been meeting every three weeks for a whole year, and so this is the result of a lot of that thinking. Now, the title of this was recasting and reifying. Now, this is one of those slides you don't have to read because I'm going to tell you what it says. The idea is recasting is I'm going to use language in the way that a child, a parent, a child uses language, which is I'm going to actually just speak to you, and, and when you say something. You may actually think about what, the way I'm responding, and I may reframe the question, I may reframe the, the way that I say something. Um, for those of you, uh, I, have, I have a curiosity uh, about uh, some people I've met. Every once in a while I meet someone who's really, really brilliant, and I can't figure out why. And after a while, then I ask, are you Jesuit trained? And they go, oh yes, as a matter of fact, I'm trained by Jesuits. And it's like, oh. So uh, what I, one of the things that's a distinction now is that um, is that uh, our Prime Minister, Trudeau, is Jesuit trained. And so I've now gotten used to, when, whenever you see Trudeau on the television or hear him, when he's responding to questions, pay attention to the way that he frames and gives his answers. Because sometimes he reframes them or he, he does it, but also there's a, uh, a French-English thing happening. Because when you, when you answer it in French, it's the same way you do in English. So whenever I see him on television, I, 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 I focus on the content of what you thought. I'm actually very concerned about the form. Um, in this case, I'm going to recast, change the way I think about it. But I'm also going to try to reify. And reify is actually from the uh, from computer science. And what they have is when they've invented object-oriented programming. When you object-oriented programming or object-oriented design, you end up with this is the first class object. And then these are all the other objects associated with it, right? So you end up with this ontology. And what happens is sometimes you end up and you work, and work with a tree of meaning, and it's like, oh, no, this thing made down here is actually the most important thing, so I need to invert the tree. And what we're trying to do now is think about whether, if you think about system changes, is that different from thinking about systems of change? So in the system story we got this morning about, um, about EQAO, the question I'd ask is, okay, that's a good system, System story. What, ha what What would you change? So, is the alternative not to have it? Is the alternative to have an international standard where everyone around the world has it? Is it to you know? So, it's so, so it's one thing to talk about the system, but then it's like, where if you are designers, you are going to change a system, and usually there's already a system that's already been in place. One of the key rules for system thinkers is do not intervene in a system that you don't understand. So the idea of synergy, people think, oh, you know, you combine two things and you make something better. David Hawk talks about the idea of negative synergy. It's actually possible you can take two things, put them together, and make things worse. There's a lot of things that have the potential for negative synergy. <coughs> the idea of systems change was actually triggered by this um, meeting that happened in summer of 2018. Uh, the story was that 
on a, a Friday morning, I get a message over LinkedIn from Benjamin Taylor. He and I run the Systems Community Inquiry online together. So getting on a plane from London, uh, you want to have lunch on uh, Tuesday, and it's like, okay, you couldn't have given me more warning. It's like, why are you coming to Toronto? So it turns out he's coming to this meeting, and then I figured out, oh, this is the meeting that Peter Jones was talking about. So the, uh, the Wasson Island meeting was a meeting of the Social Innovation Exchange. Uh, and the Social Innovation Exchange is a uh, group of all of the large foundations in the world that do funding. And so they're focused on this question about, okay, what system change? Um, you can see the list of people that were there. Uh, Peter Jones is here. Uh, but our intent in the content of growing use of the term system change and increasing interest in systemic approaches to address some of the world's most complex challenges. We wanted to convene a retreat, bring together <coughs> practitioners, academics, funders to explore how we might work together to build the field of system change. So that's a nice goal. And what they did uh, is actually they dodged it a little bit because when they actually got to the meeting, they said, well, actually, we're not going to discuss the definition of system change. However, we had people write in in advance, and so they had this idea System change, which is shifting, changing, transforming, mind, mindset, mental models, patterns, dynamic patterns, in order to, through, all this sort of stuff. Now, as someone who's worked in this, um, in this community, I got started in the systems community in 1998, uh, and it was a result of teaching at IDM, and Steve Hackle writing his book, Adaptive Enterprise, they sent me, in effect, to, uh, to learn with uh, Russ Acoff and fell into the community. Um, there is one community or one approach, which is we need to change the mindset of everyone and then the system will change. I'm not one of those. One of the reasons I'm interested in system change is that people want systems to change and they don't. And then other people say, well, there's too much change. I wish that they wouldn't change the system. But mindset may not be enough. <coughs> And that's what makes systems really interesting, is changing mindsets is part of it, but it is not all of it. If we go into why we have this interest from the funders, they have um, this program. This is really from the Kellogg Foundation in 1998. They have a logic model. So the question is, how do you get funding from a foundation? And there's one of three ways, a theory approach, an outcome approach, an activity approach. A theory is that. We think this is going to happen, give us the money, and we'll make this change. Uh, we have the outcome approach, I will guarantee you this thing, or an activity, which is I will do this thing. From this comes this idea of theory of change. Now, I've been around a long time, and it's like only a couple of years ago I heard this idea of theory of change. Now, I'm a member of the Center for Social Innovation, and so they use the word theory of change there. And it's like, what do you mean by theory of change? Like, I'm actually, you know, PhD program, teaching graduate programs and theory of change. What's a theory of change? And it turns out this comes from, the, uh, from that sort of work at the foundation. The theory of change for them commits the donor to a set or class of giving targets. So this is about funding. Theory of change is what they're all about. And if you look at the theory of change, it's like pretty simple. Activity, output, and outcome. That's pretty linear. It says, you give me the money, I'll do this activity, it will have this outcome, have this output, and then that will cause outcome. And the theory of leverage says, oh, well, the, the philanthropic community will give you money to do that, and they want, of course, to have impact on the world. But then the idea of theory of scale, which is broad public impact. And this is kind of like, okay, so you do this project, and then you assume that it's going to scale up. Right? So we're all going to work on hydrogen and oxygen, and all of a sudden it's like, we have water. It's like, whoa, no, I think this is not quite the way that systems work. So when people talk about issues with scalability, the question is, what were you designing in the first place? So using my computer example, okay, so IBM started off in the mainframe world, and then they invented the personal computer, which other people had invented various technologies, so they created it. And then what they eventually did was if you had started looking through the history of OS2, is in effect they were trying to miniaturize the mainframe. And you go, maybe you don't want to miniaturize the mainframe. You don't want a small mainframe. You actually want a personal computer that is different. 
So mainframes were always multiple user, multiple applications running at the same time. The first PC that came out was one user, one application. No multitasking. How do you get the price down? That's the way you do it. So we're going, well, you know, okay, we'll start off with a PC and we'll build it up and scale up. And you kind of go, okay, you have a system now designed for one user and one application. And now you say you want for multiple users, multiple applications, because people are logging in and stuff. And it's like, well, is that a change in scale? Or is that a change in type? change in type generally if you're going up. So if you're actually thinking about the theory of change, where is the part where you get this decision about change in type? Henry Mintzberg is a professor at McGill University, well known in strategy and organization behavior. And he has this chart that I really like for business people, which is people do strategy. And they have an intended strategy. Um, of that intended strategy, you end up with these unrealized strategy things that you didn't do, but you have this deliberate strategy that ends up with a realization in the end. However, you've got this emergent strategy that comes up. You've got all these things that happen that you didn't plan for. Is that part of the strategy that happens? Because that's what really happens in the world. And so this is the beginning of a system's view, which is some things you control, some things you can't. In particular, we're talking about human beings. Human beings are pretty unique because they have will. They do all sorts of things that you don't want them to do. They have unintended consequences. So there's two ways of thinking about nature. And this goes all the way back to the fifth century, um, before uh, fifth century BC. And it, it comes down to a question, when you think about systems and when you think about the world, how do you think about it? The first is, what is real? Reality can be seen as a changelessness state. So the only thing that is real is that which does not change. Parmenides is the person that actually started, and Confucius is very similar, uh, and these are platonic solids. They're ideals. So you have the ideal cube, you have an ideal sphere, and what you're trying to do is saying there's an ideal that you can work towards. Now, what happens if things change? Well, we'll handle that, right? So, but the, the, you know, the number one assumption is the things that are real are things that don't change. And so we handle that by saying, okay, a shift happens. Uh, we can now talk about stability points where you know it shifts a little bit. Uh, and you end up often with this question about sustainability. And this is an analytic paradigm. Analytic means taking things apart. So when you're looking for things, you're actually trying to break them down into these platonic, uh, platonic ideals. Another state of the world, and this is from David Hawke's paper, uh, you can find on the web, is that reality is a state of change, not a change of state. In this case, the only thing that is real are things that do change. Anything that doesn't change is not real. And this comes from Heraclitus, and Lao Tzu is behind this. And in this case, you're embracing the dynamic. Things that change are beautiful, and things that don't, like uh, they're trying to protect the static. You end up often with, with this resistance, which is, oh no, we want things to not change. You ever heard the old joke that a a man marries a woman hoping that she'll never change, and a woman marries a man hoping that he will. In this case, the contextual appreciation you get is from the, the, con the appreciation is of the context, which is outside of the system. What you're looking at is the idea that the river you walk into is a different river every time you step into it. Now this happens to also coincide philosophically, um, and this is new research. This is uh, Lee, Peacock Lee, 2017. I've been looking into um, traditional Chinese medicine a lot. I've been with a Chinese doctor for 30 years. I believe in Western medicine, but it has limits. Al was saying that traditional Chinese medicine has limits. But I don't know. And uh, I discovered this book, which is, uh, my joke is, it's the only book I've paid full price for in the past 10 years. Um, and uh, it's worth it. I've excerpted it on my blog because most people can't get the inside of it. 
But the question is, why is traditional Chinese medicine a different system from Western medicine? And so can you judge a traditional Chinese medicine by Western standards? And what Kikok Lee says is, well, you don't judge a dog in a cat show, and you don't judge a, dog, a, a cat in a dog show. So there are paradigms here, and you have to make sure you're clear on them. Dualistic logic, which is modern Western formal logic, abstract and permanent, independent of context. We are looking for universals. So when you think about physics and where, where Western science comes from, a lot of it is building up from physics. And they start from the, that, that supposition that what you can do is we break things down into smaller and smaller parts, and when we build them up again, we'll understand them. As opposed to the contextual dyadic, classical Chinese implicit logic, which says application of meaning is relative to a particular context. And so in this case, we can't judge something without knowing the environment around it. We can't judge a system without understanding the environment as well. System and environment are two ideas, and you're going to find that in the way I'm lecturing today, as in the way I lectured before, I'm starting to bury, I've actually gotten a fair, um, fair way through the lecture, and I've not used the word environment yet. And that's on purpose. And we stop and think about it, well, what is a system? And systems are not real. <coughs> this, is always, this is a big debate that we have in the system community, particularly around the systems engineers. Uh, I work with in COSI, and that's always a big systems engineers think about, oh, systems are real. And you kind of go, no, systems are what we talk about. And what happens <coughs> is that when we get into a group, the first question we're asking is, which system are you talking about? Are you talking? Like education, are you talking about Ontario? Are you talking about the world? Are you talking about your local school? Which system are you talking about? And if you're going to change one system, will other systems change in response as a consequence? There's a context. Changing in the context is not static. There's oppositions in dualistic logic. And so we'll see some of this as, uh, particularly if you get into research methods, um, there's philosophies in effect, Western philosophy is based off black and white. And if you think about the traditional Chinese yin and yang, you have the drawing, there's a little bit of black and the white, and a little bit of white and the black, right? And so it's kind of like, how do you reconcile those? Well, they're different, they're different. Uh, the frame here is hierarchical, and you think about breaking things down, reductionist, which means you're actually trying to get down to those basic elements and focusing on the thing, the platonic solids. Where if you talk about yin and yang, more harmonious whole, how do things fit together uh, and a mutual engendering or constraining? Things are not static. When you change one thing, there's always something else that changes. So we need both approaches, but you need to often think about when you are thinking about, um, about something like systems changes, so a key behind system changes, and, and people don't think about this, you'll pay attention now. When someone uses the word, pay attention to whether it is system or systems, singular or plural. <coughs> it is actually systems thinking, because it's plural, on purpose. One of the small cues, though, system dynamics is a field. It's singular. System dynamics. I got corrected on this because I didn't pay attention. And someone said, oh, by the way, system dynamics. The system dynamics of fire. Oh, okay. Well, what does that tell you? And then the changes are also plural. So we're somewhere more towards the right side than we are toward the left side. And the five questions that have come out of a year of thinking about this are these five. Um, which, what, why, whom, where, when, and how. I hope to cover most of which today, which is related a lot to uh, <coughs> finding out system, uh, the, uh, the system boundaries are. Uh, we're going to get into what um, if I have time, and we'll stop at a certain point. But then the uh, why, whom, and how are actually the 2013 paper and the, and the, 2012, lec the 2012 lecture and paper on rethinking the system thinking. So, the, um, this three, four, and five are published, 
and we'll get to them eventually in other lectures. Um, I will cover the number one most today. Okay, so I'm talking about systems, and it's very abstract so far. So let's give you some concreteness a little bit around this. This is one view of systems, and systems are about parts and wholes. So we have four types of systems, according to Russ Acoff, which are according to purpose. Purpose is an end, a goal, a target, whatever you want to describe it, and that's the way a lot of people think about it. Not all systems are purposeful. And you get into a problem in biology because you ask, okay, what is the purpose of a cell? Well, the purpose of a cell doesn't necessarily choose to do things. So it's like, does making goals make sense for a cell? Like, you could, you, we, that's something that we ascribe to it. But you know, a cell is a cell. It just does what it does. So four types of systems that um, Acoff described. One is deterministic or mechanistic. And in that, the whole has no, part, has no purpose and the parts have no purpose. So if you look in the example of an automobile, which they call uses, a car does not choose to be a car. The engine does not choose to be the engine. You can describe the engine as part of the car. Good. And so you can do have a system. A car is a system. It's not one that has purpose. The second category, animated, which generally is associated with biology, uh, with a slight distinction that the reason it's called animated is that uh, he makes a distinction between plants and animals. So this does not include plants, because plants don't actually choose. Animals move. And when they move, they choose where to move. So an animal has purpose in the whole so we are all human beings, and I can choose to move or not move. But my heart is a part of me, and my heart doesn't choose to be touching an our cat brain and involuntary muscle, right? So we have that distinction that if people start thinking about systems, they think very mechanically. And they think, oh, the world is like a machine. It's like, well, the world's not like a machine. It's like a brain is like a computer. It's like, ooh, that's pretty dangerous. You see the brain is like a computer, it's like, well, the brain the computer doesn't choose. Unless you want to watch Skynet. You believe in Skynet. Like I don't I do not believe in the singularity. You can have a debate about that afterwards. But uh, you know, does a machine choose in the whole? Okay. <laughs> That's it. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll have the game with singularity later. Uh, the yes. third one, social systems. Sorry, yes. Nope. Nope. All the discussions about that too, and separately <laughs> offline. I worked with IBM. I can like, discuss blockchain. So okay. like, yeah. No, they, does, does the blockchain choose to be a blockchain? Oh, okay. okay. Blockchain doesn't choose to be a blockchain, and do the parts of the blockchain choose to be parts of the blockchain? It's like, no. I want to arrange them. So, so, so now you get into: well, is blockchain a social construct or is it a mechanical construct? Yes. Right, so if we get into this, social means that we as a group, as a class, we can choose. So we chose to start at 8.30, we could do that. Individuals who choose to sleep in may choose to go to another section, right? Individuals have choice, a whole has choice. The fourth categorization, ecological, you're gonna see the word ecological, and after this you're gonna go, I've been using that word for a long time, never there's an ecological man. This is one of the uses of the word ecological in systems, which is it has choice in the parts, but not choice in the whole. So if you think of the stock market as being ecological, you may be able to manipulate one stock. Maybe you work in a company, you can manipulate one stock. But for you to manipulate the whole stock market is a pretty big deal. You know, can you change the temperature of your house? Yes. You have a thermostat to make it warmer or colder. Can you change the Temperature of a whole world, well, there's a lot of people contributing to that. So these are four different categories, but this is only one way of looking at systems. But now you're starting to think about, okay, we're working across mechanical systems, and working across biological systems, we're across social systems, we're across ecology, and this idea of systems. And 
so what is it with systems? Is there things that we can learn from one type of system that are applicable for others? At the same time, we need to recognize that it's systems theory, which means that there's more than one type of system. Okay, let's talk about systems changes through an illustration. I'm going to play uh, six minutes of a video. This is from Edward uh, Pertinsky's Watermark, and uh, it is about uh, marine aquaculture in uh, Yuoyuan Bay. And I want you to think about two things as you're watching it. One, what systems are you seeing? And two, what systems are changing? And when I say changing, now you're going to think about, well, when I'm talking about change, what do I mean by change? The buzz in the speaker. Okay, what happened here? Hey, guys, who? This is a very strange situation. 什么不景观是中的还是阳还是我们建筑的公共环境都有期限实际上的肯定是不好的吧 OK What type of systems did you see? So, okay, so let's focus on um, on this question now, because one of, the, one of the questions that you end up dealing with is which system are you going to deal with? Uh, and so if we, if we think about abalone farming, now one of the things that they said in the video is, well, why do we band together? Because abalone happens naturally, right? So then if you think about, well, what is abalone farming then when they do this? Is that actually a ecology, or is that a social system? Because the people didn't have to do this, and they made a choice where they put the people together. Okay, so so it's very important to frame it. Now you also end up with the question of systems change. Um, has anyone been on a farm, a near a seafood farm, or anything like that? So the, one of the ISSF meetings we had was in uh, how long uh, in, in, in Vietnam. Um, and in uh, Hailong Bay, in fact, it's similar to this. In Vietnam, they've actually banned these. What, what they've actually done is that the government has funded to have people move off them. Because when you look at these farms, people are living on the water. They're living on the rafts. They're cooking, you know, living, sleeping. They're there all the time. And there's a huge amount of human waste and other debris that happens when people have to happen. And, and so in Vietnam, they actually have paid people to not do this. But you need to appreciate that, um, just looking at this, that China provides 72% of the seafood in the world. So is this sustainable? Is you said this 72%. 72% of the seafood in the world comes out of China. This is the East China Sea. So they've taken advantage of natural resources because they have the East China Sea and it has the ability to do that. But it comes down to, does the social system override the ecological system or not? And then you end up with the question about whether human beings 
are part of nature or not part of nature? <laughs> okay, so we come to this question of which, and the which that I'm asking specifically is which holes, containing holes and parts, and I'm actually, actually interested a lot in living systems, in living holes, because now if we go back to that which is real versus that which is not real, I'm interested in the things that are changing. Here's the definition for a system, I don't necessarily, uh, okay, I don't disagree with it, let's go. A system is a whole that cannot be divided into independent parts. And we have a whole, which, and you'll often see the term, a system of interest. When you are declaring that you're going to work on this system, it doesn't mean that it's not going to impact other systems, but you have to say, well, this is my system of interest. I focus on working on this system. They go, yeah, that rubber comes over there. It's kind of like, well, you know, we all have to manage our scopes, and this is what we work on. When you work on a research project, you're going to have to declare your system of interest, otherwise it'll be all over the place. Every part of a system has properties that lose it when separated from the system. Water, hydrogen, oxygen, right? Flammability gets lost when you go from hydrogen to water. Every system has some properties, the essential ones, that none of the parts do. Now, essential is actually an interesting judgment call. Uh, Russ Aikoff says that in a car, a cigarette lighter is not essential to the operation of the car. That's a call of whether it's essential or not essential. Uh, you could actually get to the point where you say if it's essential for life, that might make some sense. Uh, otherwise, it's a little discretionary. Now, one of the, the problems with this definition and this diagram is it tends to get you thinking about things at a point in time. You want to be thinking about systems as living that change over time. So the changelessness and the change get to be things they have to consider. And when, when you start thinking about actually doing your synthesis maps, when you do your synthesis map, are your, a good synthesis map will actually include time. Because things are not just snapshots. You have to be able to change with time. Paul, oh, do you want to say something about the uh, ACOP readings? Each, you know, it's each, each slide actually has a different reference. And, it just, and those are really classic papers and books, just, you know. And, and you're, so you're drawing from, well, from uh, the mismatch of models, you know, first, and then trans uh, the corporate future. Just. Sorry, I'm saving you guys a lot of reading, is what I'm doing. If you want to go back to the references, you can go back to the references. I've done all of that work, and that's why I keep blogging, because... Uh, so, so uh, if, if you actually read my stuff, there's, there's multiple things that happen. One is when I blog, I blog specifically when I'm trying to figure things out, particularly when you get two different points of view and they say something, so Christopher Alexander says this and Russell Lakoff says that, it's kind of like, these are the same word, but in different ways. And I, a lot of my blog is that way. Um, getting a journal published article is a little bit different because then you have to be very coherent. And my, you find my blogging sometimes is scattershot that way. But even here, like what's ACOF, so let's see what the next page is. Uh, the next page is a different, different article. It's 1971. It's 10 years earlier. So an environment of a system consists of all the variables which can affect the system state. So you have the classic idea of a system drawn, and he says, the state of a system at a moment in time is a set of relevant properties which the system has time. Now, this is Russell Acoff, who was an architect. He thinks buildings first. And he invented operational research, operations research, management science. He was the birth of that. Uh, and a lot of that, that um, post-war uh, research was like sending missiles up and doing physics and stuff like that. So this kind of reflects that, where he says, state at a point in time. OK, so we have a system, we have this environment. But that's because if we talk about environment, environment can change, and actually the system can change. So you have to be careful with this definition. Um, the second, the environment of the system, a set of elements and relevant properties, which elements are not part of the system but can change, so the impact. Uh, and then you have this, this um, third, you have this extra idea of field. And this comes through, and the word field is not used a lot, but it is used a lot in Tavistock and organization around 
the system and the part of the system you can actually control, which is the field. So there's a whole environment is pretty well everything. Uh, so this also relates to why uh, at York University it is the faculty in environmental studies. It's a faculty of system studies, but when they say environmental, they mean everything except the system. Anyway, looking at it. That's the use of the word ecology in a larger sense. A system can contain subsystems of components, so you have a system of interest. It's contained by, uh, you have a subsystem that, that's inside, you get another subsystem. Now these subsystems can be holes. And this is the part where people start getting a little mishy, mushy. It's kind of like, okay, I understand part and whole, but can you understand whole and whole? So you have a whole which is part and other whole. So we're talking about social systems. A social system, I as an individual am a part of a social system, but that's a context I'm putting you in. Because if I look at my body, my heart is a part of me, and it's not purposeful, but you have a, you have a part of me that is not a whole, because a heart is not really a whole, it's part of a body. But you have me that's a whole in the social system. A system can also be contained by multiple super systems. If our system of interest is the TTC, what is the containing whole for the TTC? The TTC is part of the transportation system. It's also part of the finance system. Right? It's part of the labor system. There's unions in it. And so we end up with this discussion not only going down inside a system, which is called reductionist, reductionist approach or analytic approach, but going out of the system into the larger world, which is expansionism or looking at the ecology. So how do you decide like how big or small a system that you should study? And at what point it becomes like a reductionist? Okay, so, so firstly, my advice is focus on the changes because you're only interested, my, my premise for the last year has been people are only interested in system thinking because a system is changing and they, either the system is not changing as fast as they want it to change or it's changing too fast. Okay, so once you get into that and say, okay, this is the system because people are interested in this, then the question you get into is what is the impact, what's causing that change? Uh, and you, you go down through all the lists, but after a while the list gets pretty long. So you're trying to get the, the big things that have the most amount of impact. It's, it's arbitrary, but this is exactly the sort of discussion you're going to get into when you're in your groups. Because it's kind of like, okay, here's my system of interest. And you kind of go, well, let's, what do you mean by that? Is, is it bigger or smaller? And then you get into, well, what's the field around that? How big a field are you going to do? Because the environment could be everything. So we, we, we hear the stories about system thinking is like the butterfly flapping its wings and causing a tornado. And it's like, well, yeah, except that there's things that are usually closer than a butterfly that's in Texas. So, you know, if I, am I going to start modeling the butterfly to or understand tornado in Ontario? It's like, ah, it's a pretty lot. That's a stretch. Now, human organs are parts. And here's where you get the difference philosophy. So, um, there, when we talk about, an uh, example, a kidney in the human, in the Western medicine, a kidney is a part. And there's actually a distinction between a part and a piece. Uh, so, you, it's possible to go to an auto junkyard and buy half of an automobile. The thing just gets sawed off, you want to buy just a piece of it. So, I want a front fender, I'll pick it off and, you know, do whatever I want with it. But a part is related to a whole, but the way that we look at it in Western medicine is we have a kidney, and you kind of go the kidney is a part. But in Chinese medicine, and in, in the way they look at it, the kidney is a system. So there are multiple systems within the body. So you have to, get, you have to be clear what you're talking about. Are you talking about the kidney as a part, or a kidney, a kidney as an organ, which is a part, or a kidney as a system, which is a subsystem within the human body? So when you have the, something, when I take an herb to influence the kidney system, it impacts other systems within your body. The definition in my 2013 article, which I'm not going to back down on, but will expand on, is system thinking as a perspective of parts, tools, and their relations. 
Now, Russ Acoff, the way he approaches this is we start off with function. Function is a contribution of the part to the whole. So we have a part and we have a whole. So the heart functions to pump blood in my body. The engine serves to push a car forward. Now, when you talk about human systems, we generally use the word role as opposed to function. So a person have a role. So I have a role here as an instructor. You have a role here as students, which we could flip. I could be a student, you could be an instructor. Structure is an arrangement in space. You have a part. Process is an arrangement in time. Now, this is important, important distinction, because you've probably never thought about those. You use the word function and process before I see them all the time. Skill testing question, which comes first, structure or process? Structure? Why would you say structure? <coughs> Anyone first? How, okay, how many people think structure? How many think process? How many people are not thinking? I think they both evolve at the same time. So I was in the systems community for eight years and I was just walking across from one meeting to another with someone senior and this said, which comes first, process or structure? He says, oh, it's obvious. And I go, uh, it's not so obvious. I've been studying for a while, and I don't have to process comes first. The reason that process comes first is that time is a one-way arrow. There's a second law of thermodynamics, and things go from order to disorder. And when you look at something like a mountain, we think that a mountain is structure. But a mountain changes. It just doesn't change at the pace that we can actually see it. So we call the mountain structure because now we define our system of interest. And we say, well, relative to things like, you know, so on a human scale, a mountain is structure. But if you look on a world scale, where we are just like zero, like a mountain changes. You look over millions of years, a mountain will change. The third idea is a behavior is a systems change which initiates other events. Now, we talk about behavior, and you'll Again, if you, people use the word behavior, like this child should behave, the question is what do you mean by that? I'll expand on that a little bit with um, uh, the idea that living systems have behavior. Yes? If we go back to the chicken or egg, or that structure, are you saying that you get structure, or that the process happens because things are living systems and they're changing? You said it very well, process begets. Uh, no, so, okay, so what's happening is now you're getting into the, the, the challenge of talking about, like, so, th so you're asking a really deep system question. I'll answer that. Um, the, the question is when you're talking about a system, are you talking about a system over time or over a single point in time? And that's when you end up with this definition. So when you're talking about uh, a mountain and minerals, well, so they're kind of just there. They're both there at the same time. Um, what's interesting about it is what's changing. So are you saying you want to extract the minerals, which would be a process, or, you know, and, and, and this, one, this one takes us back to, well, what's real? So what happens is that there's a question as to whether you can change the structure or whether the structure is constraining and you can't change it. And then we say, well, you can you change a mountain? And it's kind of like, well, you can. It's a lot of efforts. And then you have to decide whether it's worth it or not. But that's one of the assumptions. When you work with a client, typically you talk about scope of work, right? So the scope is, well, what can I change and what can I change? Within the amount of time that you are actually being hired to do the work. Yes. And budgets and all of those other, there's a, there's also the systems of, of the work itself that constrain. Okay. 
In authentic system thinking, synthesis precedes analysis on a containing whole to appreciate it. ACOF has a definition of synthesis precedes analysis. First step, identify a containing whole system of which the thing to be explained is a part. Let me break that down for you. The thing to be explained, the streetcar is late. Okay? The whole containing system. Okay, the streetcar could be late if you're looking in terms of transportation system. The streetcar is late because of traffic, because of the transportation system. The streetcar is late because there's not enough streetcars. Financial system. The streetcar is late because the drivers are gone on strike. Labor system. Weather could be a reason for Weather, yes. So, the first thing is the containing hole. Work on the containing hole and read what containing holes you have control or don't have. Explain the behavior properties of the containing hole. So, why is the weather bad? Is it because of climate change or is it just something that everyone should have known? There was no, uh, uh, no alert. They didn't tell us it was going to snow and then, you know, they didn't set up snow piles. Uh, is it because of, uh, you know, funding issues? Then explain the behavior or property of the thing to be explained in terms of its role or function within the containing hole. So when you get on the streetcar and the streetcar is late, think twice about yelling at the person driving the car, driving the streetcar. The guy's got one control, right? It's on or off. So there's not much control they actually have, but the containing system has lots of control. The synthesis before analysis is a really tough thing to do, but this is what system thinkers actually get you into, is not, not yelling at that streetcar driver. <laughs> okay, um, there's a, uh, a BBC series on YouTube that I encourage that you, uh, you look at, it's called How Buildings Learn. And this was done by Stuart Brand, who is uh, one of the co-founders of the Long Now Foundation. And when he originally started his work, what he wanted to really study was organizational learning. We're back in those days when organizational learning could even practice and stuff started coming out. And the problem was that we can't really study organizations uh, because they don't have enough time. So he said, well, let's study buildings. Uh, now, he had his trait as a biologist. And so when we talk about the word learning, people would normally think that the building is the, is the system and then the people move in and out of it. In the system sense, you can use learning in another sense, which is Let's assume that the people are kind of static and the buildings change around them. So buildings learn, and we might call that evolution, but evolution usually doesn't, uh, usually doesn't associate itself with interaction with the environment. And we talk about normally learning from the environment. So in this case, he created this series called How Buildings Learn. And he has this shearing layers or pacing layers approach to looking at the world. And this responds to your question about um, Let's go. We start off with site. And the site of a building is where you put the foundations in. After that, you put in the structure. The structure is the load-bearing walls. Because you're going to have to put a roof on all this, so you need those up. You then put a skin around the structure, because the structure is not made to withstand the weather. So you need some shielding around it. And this is something architects just know. You know, after you put up the structure, Let's keep everything dry. We don't want the rain in there. And the, oh, the exception to this is the Pompidou Center in Paris, where they put the pipes on the outside, and they're always running into the problem of the pipes corroding, so they keep repairing those. That's the case, case where you put a structure on the outside. Services. The services are like plumbing, electrical, um, HVAC, all that sort of stuff goes in. And you put that in after you've got load-bearing walls, because you have nothing to attach unless you have to the, unless you have the walls up. You then have the space plan. The space plan are the non-load-bearing walls. So I think that probably that wall there is not load-bearing. We have this huge pillar here. So I imagine that if we wanted to make this room bigger, we could actually punch through that wall, and it wouldn't be such a big deal. If we had to take up this pillar, that would be a really big deal, right? And the last is stuff which is furniture, things that we move around, we move at will. So as a designer, you make choices in all of these. And the question is, which are you trying to do? So take the difference between whether you have a closet or an armoire. You can put a closet in 
to, uh, and that the closet is part of the space plan, but if you have the armoire, it's part of the stuff, it's part of the furniture. The difference is, your point of view of how long it's going to take, if you are renting, you might want an armoire because you can take the armoire with you. You can't take a closet with you, right? But it's like that closet is already built in. So when you're working in the pacing layers, the question is, what speed are you working at? Are you working like, okay, we need a one month change, we need a one year change, a five year change? If you were in a five year change, you'll be constrained by the things that are on a 10 year change. And, you, and, and if you're in a five year horizon, it's like, oh, there's lots of things that are gonna happen underneath in a shorter period of time. But those are kind of the things you end up working on. You can't change everything and now you're just scoping which system are you talking about, not only in time, but also in space. Yes? And now you're seeing it from the outside. So the folks are looking inside the tube. You're outside the pyramid. You're saying, okay, this is the world outside. And trying to understand it at that point in time from today. If we talk about learning, there's different levels of learning. Um, this is a, a model that's built off uh, Gregory Bateson. Uh, Gregory Bateson was a uh, fairly prominent um, systems person. If you ever see the word uh, on Twitter, Nora Bateson. Nora is the, uh, the daughter, uh, one of the daughters of Bateson. Uh, uh, and uh, other, other one that may tweak you is if you've heard of, the, if you've heard of Margaret Mead, or the name Margaret Mead, Gregory Bateson was married to Margaret Mead. And so Mary Catherine Bateson is actually the daughter of Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead, but then they separated and uh, Nora Bateson is the second wife, not the first wife. Uh, Mary Catherine is very well known in the cybernetics community and very well known as anthropologist. So, we start off with the idea uh, uh, of behavior and how we understand behavior. And Bateson came up with this idea. He actually got a research grant uh, going to Hawaii to study dolphins for an anthropologist. Yeah, you do. But it's nice. Uh, so, he went and, uh, and the question of the experiments he was running, um, in effect, we can describe in a simple story about dolphins where we start off with no learning. So what happens is that you keep trying to get the dolphin to do a trick and the dolphin does nothing. Okay, well dolphins are smart and they can actually learn. So give them a treat, dolphin goes, oh, I get a treat, and then, you know, does a trick, give a treat, you get this loop going. That's called proto-learning. And what happens is you're training to do a single thing. So you want repetition, you want to be able to do the same thing over and over again consistently. Technically, that is a change in response, correcting errors within a set of alternatives. So we can do certain things. Machines are really good at this. Machines do things repetitively. And you know when there's an error. But every once in a while, you get something outside of the environment, and you need what's called deuteral learning. So in this case, what, what Bateson had done was, the question was, can you actually get dolphins to have different behaviors to learn? So dolphin does a trick, give it a reward. After a while, the dolphin doesn't trick you, don't give it a reward. The dolphin says, wow, that was a little strange. He must have made an error because I did the exact thing I've been doing and I'm not getting rewarded for it. Does it again, does it again, not getting rewarded for this. This is not work, this is not good. It's like, oh, I hate this. It just acts out. It's like, now you give a reward. It's like, wait a minute. Okay, I did something different. Let me try that again. No, no reward. What will happen is the dolphin is now being rewarded will actually recognize that it is being rewarded for new tricks, not doing old tricks. Okay. So when you were in school, 
the question is, you know, are you being trained to be a proto learner, or are you being trained for being a deuteral learner? And deuteral learner is a change in response correcting the set of alternatives. So you had these behaviors before, now we're going to expand and we reward you for doing new behaviors. The last one, trito learning. The question is, can you actually take a system and put it in a different system and have it respond in a different way? So we're going to take the dolphin out of the tank and put it in an ocean and see if it can do tricks. Now, my friend David Hawk and I have had debates about this because what we would like to do with systems thinkers is get people to the trito learning level. Now, what's the meaning of trito learning? And we puzzled on this for a while, then I actually did a natural experiment on this, which was, um, for I have four sons, uh, and for, um, uh, we do not speak Chinese at all. I was brought up in the great universe, okay? So, uh, when, when we were really young, um, my father got called in to the school, primary school, and uh, saying, your kids are not learning English fast enough, you need to speak English at home. So my mother always spoke English, uh, my mother always spoke Chinese to us, so I taught dialect, and my father always speak English to us. And the result is that we pretty well eradicated all of the uh, Chinese we have, except uh, then I came to university, I lived with my grandmother, who doesn't speak any English. I took a little bit of, um, of uh, a Mariner course at the University of Toronto. Uh, but my sons, I had the opportunity to fix that. So I gave them my, my eldest son, uh, Adam, a proposition that said, how about you go study in China for a year? Like, after you graduate high school, why don't you go to China and study for a couple of years and come back? And that way, you know, we'll, you, you'll learn Mandarin, you'll get fluent. He goes, why would I do that? Like, that's not really something normal for you to do, right? He's like, guys, go to university. No, no, we're going to apply to a Canadian university because I want data. I, you know, everyone's going to, the normal stream is that you apply to university, but you know the universities will get deferments. So if you actually decide you actually get, you know, you have to get a job between your first year and second year here, you can actually require a question to firm and say, look, I, you know, I got this job, I can't turn it down. Let me stop for a while, I'll come back and finish this program later, right? But you can do that even at admission. So play a year of Baptist with Adam and find out, okay, this is like not a good idea, not a bad idea, okay, I'll go to China. And so uh, and so he he got the firm from the University of Toronto and he went to Reading University. And I said your goal there is to Learn the language and um, and uh, get immersed in the culture of China, understand China from the inside. Uh, now I have, I have a couple of rules. One is that uh, you can come home anytime, but when you come home, you are not going back. The second is that if you leave the country and travel around anywhere, just because China is a huge country, you could spend two years just traveling around China. You know, when you if you leave the country and you have problems getting back into the country, don't call me, it's your problem, okay? So then I said, okay, you're gonna get to China, and the reason for sending you to a university in China is, is universities have foreign students coming all the time. It's kind of, you know, another admissions officer comes in, oh, here's another one, another person who doesn't speak a little language, right? So they're used to this sort of thing. So I said, there's two things I want you to do. One is I want you to get a phone number so we can call you. And the second thing is you open a bank account and you send you money, right? So he arrives, take it out. Oh, you also need to learn, learn enough Chinese or have it written down that you can get from the airport to the university. Once you're inside the university grounds, we're sure that you're going to be able to help you out. So, so he gets there uh, in the evening, next morning, goes out and gets a phone number and calls us. Says, Got a phone number, great, thank you. We have a friend that helps him. Um, and then uh, he goes to the bank and tries to open a bank account and he's there with his passport, and it takes six hours to open a bank account for him. Six hours. And he says, what, you know, what's this about? I said, okay, this is your first lesson, which is, you come from Canada. Canada has one of the best banking systems in the world, and we don't think about it. We just don't think about it. So you go to China, it's like six hours is normal. Like, I, asked, so I, I was running a business in 2013. I went to Jamaica. And it took me three days to open a business bank account. Three days I was there. And, and it turns out that there are, um, uh, Jamaica has one of the places where they have laundering problems. And so the question is, what do you guys really, really want? We want a letter from, uh, that, not about the corporation, we want a letter about you. And so, 
and a peripheral banker, a peripheral banker, I need you to send a, 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 a letter. And what the letter says is, I never bounced a check. That's all it said. It says, okay, now I'm going for the bank account for you. So we don't think about these things. Tribal learning is that ability to go into a totally different environment. So after this, um, uh, all, all four of my sons have had gone to China, and uh, we, we're having service systems conferences, meetings in Tokyo every year for 10 years. And so I got the opportunity to take some of my sons with me. And so I took Adam and Eric, our first two sons, on one of the trips with me. And their first impression is, oh, Beijing, we know Beijing inside out, we go to Tokyo, it's going to be like exactly the same. They step off the plane, they look and they go, well, characters we can kind of rig out because they can read Chinese now, but this is nothing like China, right? And, but it's like within a couple hours, like, okay, we can figure out how Japan works. You know, it's a lot easier than China. China's a third world country. Japan is a developed country. And then some, and I, another trip, um, I had uh, my, my second two sons come. Uh, actually, Peter was there, and he, he, we took him on the tour of the, of the southern uh, part of China. Probably part of the Japan uh, coast, um, and, um, and one of my sons, I went on another trip, which is in Paris. I went to Paris, and uh, it says, you know, we have French signs in England, uh, French signs in Canada. This is nothing. So the ability for you to take a person and go to different environments is what we'd like for this group to become, trying to learn. But when you're talking about systems change, these are different types of change that you're looking. I take any questions? We should probably we should wrap. We should wrap or okay. as soon so we can take a fifteen minute break. Okay. Have time for the, the workshop. And okay. So let me cover. I'm gonna jump and cover. Um, let me go. Okay, and I'll do this one. Um, yeah. There's more for later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, there's a you should make the distinction between systematic and systemic. So systematic tends to be the idea that you would actually change things in a methodical way and you have a process associated with it. When you're talking about systemic, you tend to be thinking about something like a genotypic change. Are you actually changing the DNA of something? Something that's different. Russell Aikoff has a different a definition, makes a distinction between transformation and reformation. A reformation is changing the structure of a system without changing its function. So if you're building a computer program, you're on the web, there's lots of reformations that happen. You go to the web interface and you're buying something on Amazon or something, and they're changing all the stuff underneath, but it always looks the same to you. That's all reformation. There's also transformation, which is changing the function and the structure. Or if someone has said, you can't caterpillar your way to become a butterfly. There's a transformation that happens. When you're a larva, you have these behaviors, you have this sort of environment, the line of this food. When you become a butterfly, you kind of metamorphosis, you've got to be transformed. Yes? So is uh, systematic the reformation that you refer to? Yes, they tend to be, yes. And so this is when we get into systems change. When people say, oh, I want systems change, do they want a systematic thing, or do they want a systemic thing? Now, the interesting little dynamic happened with this course. This course name originally was Understanding Systems, and it's now called Systemic Design. Not systematic design. It's a systemic design course. How do we do that? Uh, yes. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. No. So because so would, would you say uh, so if, if we go back to the, the chart we're talking about intended strategy and emergent strategy? So what would happen if you did nothing and everything changed even if you didn't in the way that you liked, but you had nothing to do with it? It's like you take credit for it, but you know. So it, it's actually possible to get change <coughs> without having intervention, right? The world will change naturally. Oh yeah. 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 As a designer, too, you have to make your decisions. Well, you make decisions measured based on 
the scope of the work. Uh, but if you think about the caterpillar metaphor, like the caterpillar in its whatever that cocoon, whatever that's called, uh, actually goes down to like a goo of its component parts and then reforms itself uh, into the, the next structure of itself. And the work of, of systemic design is pulling something back as far as you can and then making, but you don't have often choices around how far you get to go with those things. And so sometimes you have to do systemic interventions that will likely have, or sorry, systematic interventions that will likely have systemic implications, but you don't have the choice of, of that. It's bounded by your, by many things, including scope of work, client budgets, politics, mm. eight million other things. Okay, I'm gonna cover one more slide, and then you'll be in sync with the other class, because uh, this is about far we got last time. So uh, we kind of covered the which question, and we'd be start, and after that we'll enter the what question. And the what question is around affordances, capability, and capacity of the landscape, which I won't be able to explain until later in the course. But it's based off this idea where we talk about behavior. Now, behavior is a word that is used in a sense uh, in systems. You go back to psychology, you go back to Pavlov's dog, ringing the bell, and the dog salivates. So what happens with behavioral psychology is they're trying to figure out what's going on inside your head. There's a different branch of psychology called ecological psychology, which is trying to figure out what's happening outside your head. J.J. Gibson, who created the term affordance, was trying to figure out how it is that you look at a plane that is landing on a Navy ship. The plane is moving and the ship is moving, right? And you've got the pilot kind of dealing with this. And one way of saying it is, oh, we need to understand what's happening inside the pilot's head. And it's like, well, yeah, but maybe you better look outside of the aircraft and see what's happening to the ship below. So when you have a behavioral approach, you tend to be looking inside the head. With an ecological approach, you're looking outside. So when you see people talking about the ecology, the question is, what's what your system of interest? Your system of interest may be this part, so society as an example, and ecology is the world because it's bigger than that. So system thinking should include both an ecological approach and a behavioral approach. And what you'll do is you'll start catching yourself about, am I trying to change the system or am I trying to change the world? Because if I'm trying to change the world, the system may or may not change. But if you want to change the system, the world may change. Okay, I think we've done enough. Your brain is full. You've got lots of ideas. Um, you have the advantage this year that I'm actually in the course. There'll be three more lectures that are kind of like this and related. Um, so there's lots of ideas. If you have any questions or stuff, we can discuss them offline and uh, just keep going. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll take a fifteen minute break, and uh, so just a little after ten thirty when everyone's back together and, and uh, brains, have been, brains have been settled a little bit. We'll, we'll have uh, an overview and then get get into um, the workshop part of this. So.